Good morning. So apparently I brought my fan club from TNG here in Munich. Um, my name is Franziska Hinkelmann. I'm a software engineer on the Chrome V8 team, and I'll talk about profiling V8. So I think we can all agree that JavaScript is incredibly powerful, not only in what it can do, but also in how fast it can do it. Um, if you think about it, it's really amazing that with JavaScript, a scripting language, you can run enterprise node servers, or you can run those massive frameworks on websites like Facebook and YouTube and Netflix, all of that with JavaScript, the scripting language. So the, the performance of JavaScript, of course, comes down to the underlying JavaScript engine, the engine in your browser or in your Node.js app that is powering and speeding up your JavaScript. So today we look at what V8 does to make JavaScript this fast and how you can profile these optimizations. Um, to, put JavaScript in a little, uh, to put V8 in a little bit of context, so as I said, V8 is the JavaScript engine in Chrome and Node.js. It's the part that takes your JavaScript source code and turns it into executable machine code. And V8 is not the only JavaScript engine. So the, the big browsers all have their own engine. There's Chakra Core that is in Microsoft Edge. There's JavaScript Core in Safari. Um, in Firefox, the JavaScript engine is called SpiderMonkey, and V8 is in Chrome. But browsers are not the only place for JavaScript. There's Node.js. Um, you can build Node.js with a Chakra Core engine, and your default Node.js comes with the V8 engine. Um, if you're using Electron, that runs on V8 and Chrome, so there's V8 in that. And then there's other engines. Uh, we've, we've heard a little bit about them in earlier talks, in the IoT talks. Um, for example, duct tape and JerryScript. Um, those engines are way smaller than the big ones that run in the browser, so you can fit them on those tiny devices, but you're trading in a little bit of the performance. And in order to talk successfully about profiling V8, we have to look at some of the internal key concepts of V8. So I'll give you in this talk, I'll try to give you an overview of some of the insights of what V8 is doing under the hood, and then I'll show you a few tools that we use internally to profile JavaScript code. So we in the V8 team use these tools to profile the code and figure out where can we speed up, what is going wrong here, what do we need to do here to be faster. Um, but of course, not only we use these tools, you can also use them on your JavaScript code. Um, and if you see something is not working particularly well according to these performance or tracing tools, you can change your code or file a bug report if it's on the V8 site. So um, a few of the concepts we are touching is just-in-time compilation, JIT, inline caches, ICs, optimizing compilers, and we'll actually get to look at some machine code. Um, we've, we've seen the, the Chrome developer tools in other talks, and we've, uh, somebody showed the uh, heap snapshots. Um, in addition to the, the console and where you can look at your HTML and CSS, there's a profile tab. And in the profile tab, you can record a profile of your JavaScript. Um, so here I created, or I recorded, a CPU profile of compiling some TypeScript. And then as you do that, you see, OK, these functions are being run a lot, and that might give you some insights into what is taking up time. But one thing that I noticed on this profile here is, is this sad little exclamation mark. So there's this function is related to, and apparently it's causing, it's sort of causing troubles in the, in the performance profile. Um, if you hover over the, the warning symbol, it says not optimized, optimized too many times. So in the next 24 minutes, we'll dig into this optimization. What kind of optimizations is V8 doing, and why is it impossible, or why was it not able to do them in this is-related to function here? All right, so a little bit of background. Um, JavaScript is dynamically typed. Um, most script languages are dynamically typed. Uh, the, 
The opposite of dynamically typed is statically typed, like C++ or Java or Rust. Um, and dynamically typed means the compiler does not know before runtime what the type of objects are. It doesn't know if something is an integer or a string, and it also doesn't know what the, the actual objects are. And not only does it not know it, it can always change over time dynamically. So let's look at this very simple object uh, created with an object literal, x and y are one. What are the properties of this object? Fairly obviously, x and y are properties. Um, are these the only properties? Well, no, object inherits from object prototype, so any property on the prototype is also a property of object. Okay, so we figured out the, the properties are x and y and those in the prototype chain, but still the compiler can't rely on that because at any time you could delete a property and you can also add more properties. So this is one thing that makes compiling JavaScript fairly hard because all the type information is only available at runtime. And not only information of something is an int or a string, but also what the actual objects look like, what properties they have. So what we use in modern JavaScript engines is just-in-time compilation. So the machine code is generated during runtime rather than ahead of time. If you think about C++, that is clearly ahead of time because you're actually doing two steps. First you run GCC-03 and then you wait until it's finished compiling and you have an executable with fast optimized machine code and then as a separate step you run that executable. That is not the case in JavaScript. If you start a node server, you don't first compile it and then run it. You, you start it and the parser parses and you compile it as you run and you recompile it during the runtime as you get more information. Um, and we do this because it's dynamically typed and there's just no information for the compiler to generate good machine code if it has to do that upfront. So um, this whole talk will focus on this very simple example here. It's a function so short, you probably wouldn't even put that in a function. Um, function load takes object as a parameter and it returns the property x of object. So you just do a return object.x. And this property x is it's super common in JavaScript, you do it all the time, even if you just do console.log, console is your object and log is the property. Um, so, very simple, simple looking, you do it all the time, but from the compiler's point of view, there's a lot that can happen. So first of all, if you call load with undefined or null, you get a type error. Um, if you call it with an object that doesn't have the property x, then the return value or object that x is undefined. It might be that object doesn't have the property X, but somewhere up the prototype chain there is this, pro this property, so we have to walk up the prototype chain recursively. Object might be a proxy, um, or X might have been defined as an accessor descriptor, in which case the get function can have arbitrary side effects. So object that X looks super simple, but there's a lot that can happen. And in fact, if you look at the ECMAScript specification, um, you don't need to read this, I just want to give you an idea how complex this tiny little object that exists in specification language. The ordinary get, this is like eight steps that you have to check and there's even like a recursion in there for the prototype chain. So it looks very simple, but if you write a compiler that's uh, spec compliant, that satisfies everything that we have to find in a specification, there's lots of steps it has to do. So I'll show you a, a trick now what V8 is doing to speed these property accesses up a little bit. All right, so here's the simple load function. Now we're calling this with this object that's a regular object, nothing special about the prototype chain or anything, and it has exactly one property named x, and its value is an integer. So as the compiler is executing this code, when it sees it the first time, we want to be spec compliant, so we have to do all the steps that the specification says we have to do. Okay, and eventually you figure out, okay, object that x is just a five, 
And now that we've figured out how to get object that x, we put this in a cache. Um, and what we put in the cache is, we don't put the object and five in it. Instead, we put in the shape of our object and where to find that integer value that we then get. So I'm not returning five, I'm returning, you find this x property um, internally at offset one of our object pointer. And I'm putting sort of in the, the shape of this object. And I associate this cache with exactly the call site for this property access. So as we keep running the program, eventually we call load again, and we get up here where we have to do a property access. Well, the compiler is smart now, and it's first checking the cache. And it's saying, hey, do you know an object that looks like regular object, no changes on a prototype chain, one parameter named x? And the cache is like, well, sure I do. You find your x by just looking at this offset. So we can use that, and we save doing these long drawn out steps from the specification. Okay. So these caches, uh, the formal name of them is inline caches. We abbreviate them with IC. So if you ever look into the V8 source code, you see IC all over the place. Um, and an inline cache is actually associated for every call site. So this small example here has two completely independent inline caches. They, they look the same and they're in the same function, but since they're not exactly the same, two separate inline caches. And what we store in those caches is um, the shape of an object and with it a, a shortcut or a fast path on how to actually get the property. And I keep saying shape of object and I wave my hands. Um, since JavaScript doesn't have classes, or it, it didn't until ES6, but that's a different kind of class, we call those hidden class, or more technically we refer to them as map, and that basically describes the, the internal shape that an object has from the compiler perspective. So you store in those inline caches where to get the, the value faster. So since you do property accesses all the time, when you can shortcut that a little bit, that already saves you some time. But that is not quite the speed yet that we need for, for those massive frameworks that we want to be, have fluent in our browser. So instead, or in addition to those ICs, um, all modern engines have optimizing compilers in addition to the basic compiler. So um, when you first start up your code, a basic compiler is compiling it, and it's, a, it's very fast in compiling the code, but the machine code is not optimal. So the machine code generated from this basic compiler is a little on the slower side, but you don't have a lot of warm-up time that you wait. And then what we do is, after you run your program a little while with this basic compiler, we call it full code gem in V8, um, we determine that some functions are hot, that they're being run a lot, and then the optimizing compiler steps in and recompiles those hot functions. So you pay the cost of spending some extra time recompiling functions, but you're getting machine code that is much faster. Um, name dropping the optimizing compilers in V8 are called crankshaft and turbofan, if you hear that anywhere. Okay, so as we combine optimization with inline caches, that is giving us a lot of speed. So if I've lost you a little bit, now is a good time to get back because we're going to look at some actual machine code. We're still looking at the simple example. Okay, ready for machine code? Okay. And I think this is super exciting that you can go down all the way to the most basic machine code to see what your JavaScript code is doing, and I'll actually explain to you what that means here. So this might look confusing, and you, it might look very long, especially since it's just object.x, but it's, it's really not that hard. Bear with me. Okay, so this is some assembly code here, and let's start up here, call stack check. That's where we enter the function. So that's it's a little bit of like preamble stuff, and now we're the call stack check is underlined, that's where we enter the function. We have to check if we can still allocate the, the function on the stack. Okay, that works out. The next thing we do is a check non-smy, 
SMILES v8 internal language for small integer. We just have to make a quick check that the object that we pass in internally on the v8 side really is, an, is a heap object and not an integer, otherwise the next steps would fail. So we make sure we really did get something that's internally an, a heap object. And now comes check maps. So I just said maps is our word for these shape of objects or hidden classes. So here we are checking maps. We are, we are checking that the parameter that we got has the same map, so the same shape, as the parameter that we've seen before when we were running this code with the basic compiler. Does that make sense? So, so we ran the code, we put stuff in our inline cache, and now that we have optimized code, we are checking that the object we're getting is matching the key in the inline cache. Okay, so if we have a, a hit on the inline cache, then we can do the, the shortcut now to get the property, or load named field in this case, we're just loading what's at offset one, and we can return this and be done with it. If we do get a very different looking object and the map is not the same, then we have to jump now all the way down here, and this says deoptimization bailout. So we collected data, filled up the cache, then we generated this machine code, which is super fast if you run it with the right data. And inside this code, when we run it, we compare the new parameters with the entries in the cache. And if they match, we know, okay, just get this x at the offset. If it's a, a new kind of object that we've not seen before, then we bail out and we actually go back to the basic compiler, slowly recompile, and do all the steps that the specification says you have to do if you want object.x. Okay, so there was one map check in there. Um, that is important for us because one check is very fast and we actually give different, we consider the inline caches to be in different states. So if there's one entry in it, we call the inline cache monomorphic, mono one morphic shape. Uh, if you have a handful in there, it's polymorphic and if you have more than four maps in there, it's megamorphic and that's, uh, that slows down everything a little bit. So here was the code where the cache was monomorphic. There was exactly one check in there for this one key in the inline cache. Here's the same optimized code, but the inline cache was polymorphic with four entries, uh, in which case you have four map checks in the machine code. Uh, so we do the four checks, not just the one check against every entry in the cache. If one of them matches the parameter you got, well, then we're good. We can do the fast. Um, fast pass to return something. If none of them match, then we jump again to the de-optimization, the part that we don't want. Okay, you can try all that out with your own code. You can just use Chrome. When you start it, push a dash dash JS flex behind it and then tell it to print optimized code and also code comments that gives you a little bit of explanation with it. And if you want to see what your inline caches are, what their states are, if they're monomorphic, polymorphic, or megamorphic, and when they're changing, um, if you run your code with dash dash trace IC, trace inline cache, you get lots of output, and we have a nice tool, ICE, the inline cache explorer, where you can load that output, and then you can uh, group it and sort it and, and see better what's going on. So you do want to use the tool because it has like a million entries for not super complicated example, you do want this to be nicely grouped and not work in your editor probably. Um, so here, for example, I, I drilled down on the is related to function, which was causing the exclamation mark that we saw in the profile. Okay. You can also uh, just more basically see which functions are being optimized. Remember, we have two compiler, basic and optimal, optimizing compiler, so you can see which functions are optimized and when, and you can also see when are they de-optimized. So the de-optimizing part was, uh, remember in this optimized machine code, when the map check didn't match, we jumped to the bottom and it said de-optimization bailout. That's what tells, what, what will then show up here is de-optimizing this function. And what we actually do is, so, when, when a function is, 
when you have to bail out because your parameter doesn't match the maps that you've seen so far, we actually delete the optimized code that we've generated. Because we say, well, apparently this code doesn't quite match what we are getting here, so there's no point in rerunning this optimized code. We delete it and we fall back to the slow basic compiler. Um, so if we go back to our initial problem here, this exclamation mark, I hope you sort of have an understanding now of what's going on here. So we're running is related to basic compiler. We're filling up the inline cache. We're running this function a lot. So eventually we decide it's worth recompiling it with the optimizing compiler using the information we had in the IC. Now we do this, we run this a few more times, and eventually it's run with an object that m matches nothing in the inline cache. So the compiler says, uh, let's deoptimize. Let's go back to slowly running this is related to. We run it again, um, fill up the cache. So it's run so many times that we optimize it. So we have it optimized again. Eventually, we de-optimize. We do this, this 10 times, and eventually, the compiler decides this is optimizing, de-optimizing all the time, which is costing a lot of time. I'm marking this to just not optimize anymore. So this is where this not optimize too many times is coming from if you look at a CPU profile. So by, by looking at the CPU profile, looking with the IC Explorer at the state of the inline caches, um, looking at the optimized machine code and looking into the source code, it's able to figure out what kind of tweaks you have to make to the code to get rid of this 10 times optimization, de-optimization thing which costs time. And when you rerun it, you don't get the exclamation mark anymore. Okay, um, as always, be very careful with optimizations. Um, don't optimize unless you have to optimize, just because you hear something here about optimizations. If nobody is complaining that your app or your website is too slow, don't start optimizing it. And if you do need to make something faster, measure first so you make sure that you hit the bottlenecks and not just things that introduce bugs and poor code maintainability but don't bring any real benefit. And also, with this one especially, um, the, what I told you and what you see in the dash dash trace IC, uh, trace opt, trace d opt, print opt code, that is V8 specific. So it doesn't help you in other engines but it's also uh, changing in V8 all the time. It's not part of the ECMAScript specification. The specification doesn't say, oh, you must have two compilers. And in fact, uh, the little engines on IoT devices, they don't have an optimizing compiler or even a JIT. This is purely V8 specific, and we're changing this all the time. So it might be that you optimize tonight for a certain polymorphic state with four entries, and tomorrow we figure out, oh, six would be a much better number to cut off polymorphic. And then you have these changes in your code that actually slow you down as we upgrade internally something in V8. Um, but I hope that you got a little bit of insight of what is happening in V8 and that I gave you some tools to get that you can apply yourself to your code if you want to dig deeper into this. So, um, you, can, you can try all this out with Chrome. Just put dash dash JS flags behind it, and then you can set them to a combination of trace up to see which functions are optimized, trace D up to see if anything is de-optimized, print opt code, and trace IC. If you're using Node, you can also use these flags. Just put them right behind Node. If you want to be more adventurous, you can compile D8, that is the debugging shell for V8, and use that with the flags. That gives you the advantage that you have less overhead that you would see uh, compared to tracing output from the browser or node, because node in the browser is doing some more stuff than just your function is doing. And if you want to look into the states of your inline caches, if they're nice, mono, and polymorphic, then you can use ICE, which is distributed with the V8 source code. Um, find me during or after the conference for any questions, or feel free to reach out via Twitter or email. Thank you very much.